happening, waiting. There we go. So today we're talking about Wi-Fi 101, uh, going through some of the basics of how Wi-Fi works. Um, at the end here, we'll give you some ideas and some best practices. And we'll also talk a little bit about both Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E. So for those of you that are new to Zycel, um, just a quick single slide here on our background. Um, Zycel has been making computer networking equipment since 1989. Um, I think technically in Taiwan, we got founded in 88, but um, we started manufacturing in 1989, and that includes here in the United States. Um, so we've got over 30 years of experience making computer networking equipment. Um, we operate and sell our products in 150 different global markets, and we have over 100 million devices deployed out in the field. Um, our U.S. headquarters is based here in California, in Anaheim. So um, when you call in um, to talk to somebody, at least pre-COVID, you were dealing with somebody at our U.S. office, whether it was tech support, whether it was somebody in shipping, whether it was somebody in sales. Uh, most of us right now are working from home. Um, but when we can, we'll be moving back into our offices. Um, we don't outsource anything. Um, so when you call in, you are dealing with a Zycel employee. It's not a call center. It's not somebody overseas. Okay, so let's start talking about Wi-Fi. That's why we're here, right? Um, so we'll start by just talking, covering some basics. So um, you'll see some of these names if you've been dealing with Wi-Fi for a while. Um, IEEE, they're the ones behind 802.11, whatever. So 802.11a, b, g, n, a, x. They're the ones who create the initial engineering standard um, that the Wi-Fi technology is built on top of. We also, of course, cover a lot of other different technologies, uh, particularly in the networking field. We deal with them a lot, even on uh, DSL, Ethernet ports, gigabit Ethernet ports. Generally, there's an IEEE standard um, that comes first. Then there is the Wi-Fi Alliance. The Wi-Fi Alliance is an industry group, um, some manufacturers, some resellers, some branders. Um, they get together, and uh, impetus behind this was back in the day when it came to Wi-Fi is um, even though everyone was following the IEEE spec, um, you know, there's still some room for interpretation of how you implement those, those requirements. Um, and it caused some issues with um, compatibility between different vendors. So the Wi-Fi Alliance got created as a means of solving those issues um, and doing interoperability testing. So when you see the Wi-Fi certified on a box, it means it's gone through the Wi-Fi process to hopefully ensure interoperability. They also do a lot of marketing. Um, the Wi-Fi Alliance is the ones behind renaming 802.11 to Wi-Fi in a number. So 802.11ax is branded by the Wi-Fi Alliance as Wi-Fi 6. Um, 802.11ac got rebranded as Wi-Fi 5, etc. And then there's the good old FCC. So that's the U.S. government. Um, and these set the rules as far as what frequencies you can use. Uh, so when we're dealing with Wi-Fi, we're talking about unlicensed frequencies, so frequencies you can use without needing to purchase a license from the FCC. And these set rules as far as things like power output and band edge issues and stuff like that. So every device that's operating um, wirelessly, whether Wi-Fi or not, um, has to be certified by the FCC, and you'll usually find that identification number on the bottom of the device. So we use radio waves. Um, so radio waves are the, basically the same technology that we're using for, you know, transmitting terrestrial TV, AM, FM radio, things like that. Um, so basically, as frequency goes up, the easier it is to cram more data on it. Um, but also, as frequency goes up, the lower the range becomes. Um, so we'll give an example here, um, at least for you old school people, older folks out there might know these ones, cordless phones in the house. Um, Back in the 80s, probably before that even, um, most cordless phones operated at the 900 megahertz frequency. Um, and you could get on that sucker and you could walk outside and you could have a conversation. You could walk across the street to your friend's house and there's a good chance you could continue that conversation. Now that 900 megahertz spectrum that was open there was really small. So you had a couple problems. One problem you had was, um, you know, if you were in an apartment building or a condo or something like that, you'd get interference between everybody's phones. The other problem you ran into was, because 900 megahertz is a relatively low frequency, is sound quality wasn't all that great. So we saw the move in cordless phones to go from 900 megahertz up to 2.4 gigahertz, right? The same 2.4 that we use for Wi-Fi. Um, it's the exact same frequencies that's being shared there. So the big pitch with those was, hey, better sound quality, less interference. 
Um, but you could no longer walk across the street to your friend's house and maintain a call. Maybe if you're lucky, you could go out to the end of your yard or something like that. And then in the mid nineties, the, there was a big push for five gigahertz phones. Same thing, less interference because there's more available spectrum. So you can have more people using their phones at the same time without interfering with each other. Even better sound quality, but again, the range was reduced. So now maybe you can not only go out to your yard, but if you've got a big McMansion, maybe some rooms in the house, the cordless phone isn't working because again, as the frequency goes up, the signal goes less, less distance essentially. So radio frequencies are regulated by the FCC. Um, and most radios require some sort of license to be able to transmit. So um, Wi-Fi operates in some select areas of spectrum which require no license. They're essentially shared. So that's the 900 megahertz. Wi-Fi doesn't play there. Um, but 2.4 is the traditional you know, Wi-Fi frequency. And then in more recent years, opened up 5 gigahertz, with, uh, particularly with 11AC um, and now 11AX. So um, when it comes to power output, um, you will generally see power um, identified one of two ways. You will see it either quoted as milliwatts or you will see it as DBM. And generally more consumer focused stuff will use milliwatts, uh, more business oriented products will use DBM. So with DBM, every three extra DBM you add doubles the output power in milliwatts. Um, so 23 dBm is double the power of 20, right? So 23 dBm is 200 milliwatts. 20 dBm is 100 milliwatts. Um, there's two reasons generally on professional equipment you don't see milliwatts being used a lot. Um, one of those reasons is um, the way the radio frequencies degrade, um, you know, by going from 100 to 200 milliwatts, you're not getting anywhere near doubling the range. Um, so 20 to 23 provides a, a much more closer match to reality as to what you'll experience as far as Wi-Fi range, although it probably understates it a bit. Um, the other big reason for using DBM is it makes it really easy to calculate links and how much output power you actually have. So you can take, you know, the DBM, the output power of the chip, and you can add that to the DBI, which is your gain from the antennas, and you can then subtract DBI from, you know, cable loss, connector loss, things like that. So it makes it really easy to add together and calculate what your total output power is, something you can't really do with milliwatts. Um, and so if you're doing outdoor point-to-point -point links and things like that, then if you use any sort of calculator software, they all use DBM and DBI um, to calculate out how far your signal can go and what sort of data, you can ex data rates you can expect. Um, some other terms here is signal to noise ratio. This is probably the most overlooked thing when it comes to quality of your Wi-Fi experience and range. So a signal to noise ratio is basically um, the strength of the signal you want to hear versus the level of RF noise around it. So RF noise could be interference being generated from industrial equipment. Um, it can be your neighbor's access point that's operating on the same frequency. It can be other devices that use this unlicensed spectrum, things like cordless phones, microwaves, um, you know, any sort of wireless device that are going to be using either 2.4 or 5. So the signal to noise ratio makes a huge difference as far as the speed and the quality of your signal. And that's probably one of the main things to be looking at here. Um, an analogy to this would be um, just holding a conversation, right? If me and you are in a quiet meeting room having a discussion, we don't have to raise our voices. We can hear each other very well. Try to hold that same conversation at a nightclub, and you're not going to be able to have that conversation at that level, right? Because the noise level is higher. You've got the noise of the music. You've got the noise of everybody else around you. So you're going to have to shout louder to be able to hear each other. If you can hear each other and make it out at all, you may have to lean over and you know put your mouth right next to their ear to be able to hear each other. So that's the same thing with Wi-Fi. It's, uh, it's kind of your analogy there. Um, attenuation is another um, name you'll see there. It's basically just a, a fancy way of talking about how the signal will degrade as it passes through a medium. So, you know, a wall will degrade the signal or attenuate the signal more than air does, but air does still attenuate the signal and reduce it. So we've got up here, we've got our um, formula for calculating paths. So if you really want to know just how far this access point is going to cover, how far the range is going to be, this is the calculation you need right there. 20 log 10 um, of the distance, 20 log 10 of the frequency plus 92.45. 
and you're going to need that in both directions. Um, that'll give you the range. So it's complicated. It, it's hard to do. There are um, free tools out on the internet and websites that can calculate this if you really need it. Um, I'm just put it there just to show you that it, it's not a straightforward calculation as far as how far the uh, signal is going to go. And then just showing here, you know, a standard window can um, give you a 3 dB loss. Um, a tinted window can drop it up to three times more. Um, you know, if you've got one of those little metallic coatings on there that keeps the infrared out and the UV out, um, walls, things like that. So as you can see, basically the thicker something gets or the more metals inside of it, um, the greater the attenuation of the signal is. So when we're talking about Wi-Fi range, a lot of people focus entirely on their router or access point. You know, is it a 200 milliwatt, 500 milliwatt? You know, is it a one watt power? But they overlook the fact that Wi-Fi is two-way communication. Right, again, it's back to holding the conversation. So if one person has laryngitis and can't speak very loudly, then you've got to get closer to them, right, to be able to hear each other and hold that conversation. It's the exact same thing with Wi-Fi. So what we find is, you know, a business class access point is probably around 500 milliwatts, maybe more. It can shout really, really loud and send that signal a really far distance. The problem is people are using iPhones and Fire tablets, and iPads, and those don't have a lot of power at all. So those, believe it or not, a lot of those are down in the 8 to 25 milliwatt range versus 500. Now, again, like I told you, you know, milliwatts kind of exaggerate the power difference. But, you know, it's just to make the point here, there's a huge power discrepancy between these two. So it does you no good if your signal from the AP can get to the phone, if the phone can't get its signal back to the AP. So even if you're doing something like streaming, right, you go, oh, well, that's downloading. I'm not sending anything. But when it comes to Wi-Fi, you are. Um, you're using TCP. You're sending back acknowledgement requests. The AP sends a little bit of data. Your device says, hey, I got the data. Send the next little bit. So if that's two-way communication isn't happening, your signal degrades. So this is a common problem we run into with people frustrated with their Wi-Fi is they'll look at their phone, right? And the Wi-Fi is three out of five bars. You know, I've got a good signal, but the internet doesn't work or barely works or keeps timing out. And that's probably the, what's going on here. Your phone is showing you how strong the signal is that it hears from the AP. It doesn't show you, because it doesn't know, how strong the signal is back at the AP getting back to it. So it causes that situation. That also causes problems with roaming. Roaming is handled by the client device. It determines when to switch
Hey, can you guys hear me again? I'm back. My internet went down. Um, give me a sec. We'll get this back going again. Um, give me another second. Do, 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 do. Okay, my screen should be back up. You should be hearing me. Um, so let's continue. Go ahead and send me a chat or something if something's not working. Let's see if I can find the chat. Okay. So sorry about that, guys. My Spectrum connection went down. I actually lost my Doxis link. So hopefully, uh, assuming they're doing some work outside, um, hopefully it stays up this time. Um, let me get back to my presentation. There we go. Okay. So I think we were talking about RF behavior. Very similar or analogous to, you know, throwing a rock in a pond. Um, so as the waves ripple out, if there's an obstruction, they can sort of bounce off of it or, or similar. They can reflect off of things so they can wrap around it. They can hit another object and then bounce off of it. They can, when they hit an object, they can scatter into multiple different waves going out in different directions. So in the old days of Wi-Fi, this was a big problem. This was something we called multipath. Um, and it was the bane of 802.11 A and B back in the early days. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a couple slides. Another challenge we have with Wi-Fi is there's no coordination of who gets to transmit. The way it works and the way it was designed, and they've made some fixes here with Wi-Fi 6 to address this, but you know anything prior to Wi-Fi 6 um, is still operating this way. And that's basically that um, if you want to transmit some data, um, what you do is you simply listen and say, hey, can I hear anybody else transmitting? If the answer is yes, then you use a random number generator to determine how long to back off, and then you repeat the process. If you listen and no one's transmitting, then you transmit. So one of the problems you run into this is, um, obviously, if you're you know, backing off for a random amount of time, you may be backing off for too long of time. So it may cause some quality issues for things that are really latency or jitter sensitive, such as VoIP applications over Wi-Fi. The other problem you run into here is something called the hidden node problem. Basically, you've got your access point here in the middle. You've got a client over here and a client over here. The access point can hear both devices, but each laptop is too far away from the other laptop to know when it's transmitting. So you run into a situation where both decide to transmit at the same time and it causes interference here at the AP because it can't figure out who it's supposed to be listening to and your packets get dropped. This is also something that affects the question of, well, how many devices can I get on the network, right? So you'll come up and go, well, the data sheet says I can fit, you know, 128 or 256 or 512. The reality is because of the way Wi-Fi works, you're going to hit your performance limit in the real world well before you hit the theoretical maximum you see on a data sheet. Because what happens is, again, remember we're, we're looking here and we're basically listening to see if anybody else is transmitting. And if we don't hear them, then we decide we can transmit. So as you add more devices onto your network, you increase the chance of this hidden node problem but even removing the hidden node problem from the situation, you increase the chance that two devices will decide to transmit at the same time. Both will listen here, no one else is transmitting, and then both will decide to transmit at the same time. So what happens is, is you generally hit these performance issues in your Wi-Fi network. Um, it, it, it depends dramatically on what type of data you're using and what sort of you know, application you're trying to use, but generally somewhere around 30 to 60 active devices is just going to cripple your Wi-Fi network, regardless of the brand of access point or what chipset they're using, just because of the way the Wi-Fi protocol works. Um, other thing I wanted to address here is data rate versus throughput. Now, I'm using these terms in very specific ways. These terms can be used interchangeably. Um, but for our purposes today, the data rate is the rate you're going to see claimed on a data sheet or on a listing on an e-commerce site or something like that. Um, it's defined by the 802.11 standard, and it's measuring the data being transmitted between two Wi-Fi devices. So you'll also see this referred to as the physical rate or the link rate. And the key thing here is it's not just the data you personally want to send over the network. It includes all of the protocol overhead that makes Wi-Fi possible, right? We're using this in this unlicensed RF spectrum where 
who knows who's doing what using these same frequencies that we're trying to use. So there's all sorts of error checking and handshaking and weird stuff going on to make it operate as smooth as possible. And that adds a huge amount of overhead, which is included in the data rate. Now, most people, when they talk about their speeds, right, they go to speedtest.net and run a performance hit or run a performance check there to see how much data. And that works by basically transferring data from the computer to the measurement server and vice versa. So it's only measuring the data you want to send. It doesn't measure this overhead, the protocol overhead and the Wi-Fi standard overhead that's on top of that. So because of that, um, you will generally see somewhere in the neighborhood of around 60% performance hit between the data rate and the maximum throughput you can measure. And that's before we take into account things like the signal to noise ratio, um, the distance between your client device and, and you know, the uh, access points connecting to and all those other things, which can also degrade performance. So how do we increase speed? So I'm approaching this not from what you would do out in the field, but as from a technology perspective, how does Wi-Fi keep increasing the speed? How do we improve from 802.11b to Wi-Fi 6 today? So there's some, a couple ways that this is done. The first one is by increasing the encoding. So 11 and use 64 QAM, um, which is basically how much data you're cramming into these frequencies. Um, 11 AC added the ability to use 256 QAM and Wi-Fi 6 allows you to use 1024 QAM. So again, the, the higher this goes, the more data is being crunched on there. So a common question we get is, well, why, why, did, why are you taking so long? Why didn't you roll out, you know, 1024 QAM before? And the answer is just, um, you know, Wi-Fi is a delicate balance between performance and battery life on your, your mobile devices. Um, so that, that's, that's why, it, you know, we needed the silicon to advance to the point where we can do this really heavy level encoding and decoding um, without killing ba uh, battery life. So it's taken a while as, you know, operating efficiencies increase. The next way of doing it is using spatial streams. And we'll talk a little bit more about it, but if you've looked at any of our data sheets, you will see on our business APs, we talk about, you know, two by two, three by three, et cetera. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in another slide. And then I'm um, just increasing the bandwidth. 802.11G used 20 megahertz channels. 802.11N rolled out 40 megahertz channels. 11AC offered um, either 80 megahertz or up to 160 megahertz channels. So now we'll start talking about these a little bit more and we'll start by the last one by talking about um, bandwidth and frequencies. So to begin with, 2.4, the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum only has in the ballpark of around 60 megahertz of data or of frequency that's available to be used. And you go, well, when I look in, you know, pull up my GUI here, I've got the choice of 11 different channels to choose from. The problem is those channels are really teeny tiny um, and you're not using those. So when you choose a channel in, 2.4 on your access point when you're setting up your channels, you're actually setting up a channel that uses 20 megahertz of the 60 megahertz that's available. So you end up in a situation where realistically you've only got three channels that can be used without overlap. So that means that if you've got more than two neighbors and they're all using Wi-Fi, there's going to be interference. And again, that's using 20 megahertz channels. As I talked about before, you know, um, we added the ability to use 40 megahertz channels with, um, what was it, 11N. So what happens is now you're using 40 megahertz of what's approximately 60 megahertz that's available. So what happens is, is you can only have one device operating at 40 megahertz. It means none of your neighbors can also be using the full speed of their Wi-Fi router without causing interference with yours. So there's no way to avoid interference once you add more than one access point. So that was why there was a big push to five gigahertz. As you can see here, we jumped over to five gigahertz. We unlocked a lot more channels. They are properly spaced apart. Oh, I forget how many here. I wanna say it's 24. I might be off on that. But 24 non-overlapping 20 megahertz channels. But you'll notice here, there's a bunch of orange channels here we've got labeled as DFS channels. So let's talk about that briefly. So basically, there's already stuff out here using this five gigahertz spectrum before the FCC decided that we could use it for Wi-Fi and other unlicensed uses. 
So the way around that was you've designated certain channels that could be used by something else, for instance, weather radar, airport radar. Um, and they said, here's the new standard. We've got this thing called DFS, dynamic frequency selection. So this is something that must be used in order to be able to use these channels. And what it basically does is if it detects radar operating on that channel, it will then switch to another channel to use that's not being used. And I wanna say it's, it's 30 seconds or 60 seconds, it has to listen to make sure no one else is using it. So obviously that can cause some problems, right? So if you're connected, you don't want your users to get disconnected randomly because it detected radar and that five gigahertz radio is gonna go down for a little bit while it switches channels because it's gotta check and make sure the channel it's switching to also isn't in use. Other problems with DFS is in order to get DFS certified, it adds about six months to the FCC certification process. You know, six months is a huge amount of time in the tech industry. Um, so when, so a lot of companies trying to get their product out there will launch it first without DFS and then maybe we'll add it later. A lot of consumer products do not support DFS. In fact, I recently switched my home network for fun over to a DFS channel and I was shocked and how many of my very, very recent purchased products were unable to connect to these DFS channels. They couldn't see my SSID at all, or they could connect, but it, it was really flaky. I was really surprised by that. So that's something to keep in mind, especially if you're in a business and people are bringing their own personal devices onto the corporate network. Um, so by taking a look here, you can see here, if we remove these DFS channels, um, it reduces the number of channels we can use, right? So we went from what, 24 or whatever it was um, to nine channels that are not overlapping that you can use in 20 megahertz. Now to increase speed, we increase the frequency, right? So if we go up to 40 megahertz, we can now get four non-overlapping channels, which is better than, you know, 2.4 where you only had one, right? So it's still a lot better unless you get a lot more speed. But again, we've been trying to increase things. So 11AC added the ability to use 80 megahertz channels. So now you're in a situation where if you're not gonna use those DFS channels, you've only got two non-interfering channels that you can use before you start getting interference. So again, that could be if you have more than two access points in your office building, it can be whether you have neighbors that are also using those frequencies. So it starts to limit things and you start getting interference issues. And then the big daddy here was adding 160 megahertz channels. Um, this is part of the 11AC wave two, it's part of Wi-Fi six. Um, this forces you, you must use DFS channels. Um, and you can see here, you've only got two non-overlapping 160 megahertz channels you can use in the US. So that was, you know, talking about frequency and bandwidth. Now on to spatial streams. Um, so as we talked about before, you know, the waves coming out of your device can bounce off of and reflect off of things they can scatter. Um, and this is what we called multipath. So what happens is you send your data here and it comes in really quick with a straight beam to the person who's supposed to be listening. But that same signal is going out and radiating out. It's hitting this wall and bouncing off of this. It's hitting this desk and bouncing off of that. So what you end up with is sort of a echo type effect, right? You, the main data comes through first and then you've got all these echoes coming in slightly different timings based on how far the signal has had to travel to get there. They're small and minor little echoes, but it was a big problem, um, especially in the early days. Um, so what happened is people looked at this and, and found a way to make it work better. Um, Zydas, for those guys who've been with us for a long time, Zydas was our chipset provider. They owned a number of patents on how to take multipath and turn it into a net benefit. Um, and then they were, we sold them to Atheros and the rest is history. Um, but so what we did is at the end of the day, what happened is we came up, there's a standard way now of using multipath to actually benefit you. So what we can do is we can send different data on each antenna to one client device. So instead of being able to transmit 150 megabits of data, in this case, we've got two spatial streams. So we can transmit 300 megabits of data, 150 megabits simultaneously on two different antennas. And we can take advantage of the fact that because the antennas are spaced apart, the signal that the signal path is going to be slightly different. And because of that, the timing of those signals are slightly different. So the technology allows us to take those echoes or what would traditionally be echoes and confuse the technology 
and allow us to take that and send different data on each echo, creating um, an overall aggregated higher throughput. So that's where your two by two and three by three come from. So two by two is two spatial streams. Um, so with 11, 11, um, 11 AC, you know, each, each one's 150 megabits, 11 N. 11 N's 150 megabits um, a piece for each spatial stream is theoretically the maximum that you're able to send. So each spatial stream tells you how fast you could go. So if you see a product called an N300, that's telling you that there's two spatial streams because that's how you get to 300 by adding these together. If you see something that says N450, that you means you've got three spatial streams because 150 times three gets you to 450. So 11AC added a new trick to this with something called MoMIMO, multi-user MIMO. So instead of taking these different echoes and sending different data to combine together to one faster connection, MoMIMO in theory gives you the ability to take these different echoes and send them to send different data streams simultaneously to multiple clients. So 150 megabit data stream goes to this guy, a different 150 megabit data stream goes to this guy here. Now this only worked from the AP to the client devices. The client devices have to support this and there's some other little stuff that goes on to make it work, but it is, it is something there. So it's kind of cool how we've taken what used to be a negative and used it to turn our access points either faster, um, either a faster signal to one device or allowing you to send different data to multiple devices simultaneously. So when you look at the data sheets, you'll see these two by two or three by three, almost all business class products will, do, will note their speed this way. So the two X2, the first number is telling you how many transmit antennas you have. The second digit is telling you how many receive antennas you have. So a two by two is transmit to receive to. On a lot of client devices, especially mobile devices like phones and tablets, you'll often find that we don't match like this. You'll get a one by two. It can transmit a single data stream, but it can receive two data streams, things like that. And if you look at Cisco products, you'll see something kind of funky where they'll add a colon and another smaller number after it. So a good example of this is you'll see four by four colon three. So that's telling you you've got four antennas that can transmit, four antennas that can receive, but the hardware can only handle three of them at a time. So you've only actually really got three spatial streams that you can use. So putting it all together, this is how we figure out, you know, the maximum speed. So if we're looking at 11 AC products, you know, you will see on the radio, if it's a one by one, the maximum speed is 866.7. So that's what we claim. So that's assuming You've got your one spa spatial stream, you're using 256 QAM and 160 megahertz channels. Now, as we talked about, 160 megahertz channels aren't really supported by all that number of devices. So maybe at best you're at an 80 megahertz channel. So you'll see that drops the speed in half. Maybe because the signal to noise ratio isn't so good, you've had to drop from 256 QAM to 64 QAM, which is a little bit more reliable. So that'll drop your speed from 433 to 325 etc. So that's just showing you how these different things are all being used simultaneously. Spatial streams, modulation types, bandwidth to get your total speed that you're able to achieve at that time. Excuse me. Um, so we already hit on this earlier, which is, you know, how many devices can I get onto one access point? Um, we get a lot of, you know, oh, I looked at the so-and-so's data sheet. They can support 1 billion connections. Why can't you guys support a billion connections? And again, the answer is that in the real world, it has more to do with the protocol itself and the type of application you're using rather than the access point. So it doesn't matter whether it's a cheap one or expensive one. It's not going to change the protocol. It's not going to change the application. So here's an example. Um, showing you how spatial streams will affect things. So what we've got here in this example here, um, we've simulated clients here. Each client is trying to maintain a three megabit data stream. So like you're streaming from YouTube, a three megabit quality video. Um, everyone's at a 67 dBm signal strength. They're using a single uh, 20 megahertz frequency or bandwidth on the five gigahertz. Sorry, I needed to take a drink there. My, my throat's killing me. Um, so we see here in the first example, we've got laptops. Each laptop supports three spatial streams. 
Each laptop is streaming three megabits. You can cram 34 laptops on there before you're going to have any issues, giving you 70% 77% um, total airtime utilization or aggregated speed of around 100 megabits throughput. So replace those laptops with tablets that only support two spatial streams, so two by two. Um, same thing, three megabit streams. Now you can only fit 21 devices on your network before you start having issues. Go to a cheap smart Android smartphone that only supports a one spatial stream, and now you're down to just 10 devices on the network that can support that one three megabit stream before you start running into issues. So in a real world where you've got a mix of devices, you can see just how dynamic it can be as far as how many devices can be connected to your access point and keep everybody happy. Um, another one I just wanna briefly talk about here is VoIP, voice over IP. Voice applications are an absolute nightmare. They use a very little bandwidth. Generally voice is being done at 64 kilobits per second or less, but voice is not very friendly. So when you're streaming something from Netflix, you know, you can cache that data, you can build up a buffer. So if there's any interruptions, it doesn't hurt things. Voice is essentially to work well, it needs to be as, as seamless and smooth as possible with as little latency and as little jitter as possible. And unfortunately, Wi-Fi is horrible for these types of environments. So when you're trying to do voice over Wi-Fi, you run into issues a lot earlier than you would with something that you would think would be more demanding, like streaming a, uh, you know, a 720p video. Just because you can't do buffering because then it adds too much delay, um, right? So then you start talking over each other, you have to wait, it makes things awkward when there's those long waits due to latency. And then with the jitter, you know, packets are coming in out of order, things get garbled or packets get dropped. Sounds like a nightmare. So voice is one of the, the most difficult applications on Wi-Fi because it's this shared unlicensed spectrum where there's all sorts of sources of noise that can cause packets to get dropped or need to be retransmitted out of order, which just doesn't work for real-time communication. So now I wanna talk a little bit about smart antenna. So smart antenna is a technology um, we have focused heavily on having to deal with co-channel interference, right? Dealing with this interference from other devices, regardless of what they happen to be that are operating on those same frequencies. I'm gonna go through this kind of fast, um, you know, I, I, I do a lot more in-depth versions of this in other, other presentations. But basically, you know, your traditional way of dealing with interference, so in this case, we've got two access points here, um, both with your, your traditional umbrella-shaped coverage pattern radiating, radiating out in essentially a circle. So the way you would traditionally deal with this is you would you know, carefully plot out your channels to try to avoid interference and overlap. But if you can't do that, you turn the power down to avoid that overlap, which absolutely works. It helps solve code channel interference. The problem is it also lowers your signal to noise ratio. So you may see instead of performance degradation due to interference, you've now got you know, code channel interference. It's now degradation due to the signal to noise ratio being poor. So smart antenna works by instead of using a fixed antenna pattern, it has the ability to switch through hundreds of different antenna patterns. So our smart antenna algorithm takes a look both at where the client device is in relation to the AP, but we also scan for other sources of RF noise and choose an antenna pattern that focuses the signal to the client device where it is, but also so that we are not listening and picking up noise from other sources of, of interference. Again, whether it's a microwave or whether it's another access point operating on the same channel. And you would be surprised just how far away another access point can be on the same channel as you and still be causing co-channel interference. And that's just because in general, these access points are really powerful compared to the client device and most people operate them at full power. So you end up in a situation where maybe the range from a client to the AP is only, we'll say 50 yards, that's the maximum distance, but the signal from that access point may be going 700 yards. So you end up in a situation where you've got interference from other access points that are really far away. So with our smart antenna technology, it adapts on a per client basis um, in real time. Um, so it keeps track of them even with mobile devices and for smart antenna to work, there's nothing needs to be done on the client. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's fully, uh, what do I wanna say here? It's fully passive on the client device. So here's a real world test scenario. This is a hotel environment or an apartment. This is 
realistically, this is this is a hotel we tested this at. So this is showing here, we did careful channel planning in the five gigahertz spectrum to avoid having any APs directly next to each other operating on the same channel. We are not using DFS channels, so that kind of limits us to how many we can choose from. And we're covering two different floors, one AP per room using the small little um, wall mount APs that are designed specifically for hospitality. So in this scenario here, um, we have taken our device and we have taken the equivalent Ubiquity device, the UAPAC.IW. So both of our devices are essentially the same, the same basic Wi-Fi technology. The only main difference is uh, from a technology perspective is smart antenna. So we went ahead and did a simulated uh, performance here where there was only one AP operating on the channel. Um, and you see here, we, we got beat by Ubiquity. Ubiquity beat us, we, not by much, you know, 406 megabits aggregated throughput versus 404. Um, so you can see Smart Antenna really didn't do anything here. Um, so now what happens though when we turn on a second access point? Ah, now things start to get a little bit different. Again, the only real difference between our product and the Ubiquity product is the Smart Antenna. So look now at the aggregated throughput between the two APs. We're now up at 785 aggregated megabit per second throughput. Ubiquity is down here, 555. Also notice here that Ubiquity, one AP is hogging most of that, where if you look at us, the, the uh, aggregated throughput is pretty equivalent between the two. And if we look at channel usage or airtime efficiency, um, Ubiquity is topped out here at 95% airtime utilization, which is fantastic. Um, we've managed to exceed the theoretical ma maximum and go up to 131% efficiency because we're able to have both access points operating simultaneously without interfering with each other. Um, so you can use more of the available airtime. So you've got two devices simultaneously using the same airtime. So now we add a third access point on the same channel. Again, they're not right next to each other. There's a you know, few rooms apart, different floors. Um, and you see similar things. Speed, aggregated speed now is over 900 megabits. And again, the throughput is pretty evenly distributed between the access points. Where with Ubiquity, they didn't really add anything. Um, and you'll see their airtime efficiency actually went down. So they actually got lower performance with three APs than with two, where we continue to improve our channel efficiency because we're able to simultaneously use the same frequency on different access points at the same time, uh, where Ubiquity can't without causing interference. Again, that's just smart antenna. It's not, I'm not picking on them. It's, this would happen the same thing if you took an Aruba non-smart antenna AP and did the same comparison. So now just some, some other stuff here. Um, let me take another drink. So most access points are designed to be mounted on the ceiling. They have sort of an umbrella shaped coverage pattern that radiates out in a circle from them, which is great for most things. But in the real world, you know, oftentimes for whatever reason, you can't mount the access point on the ceiling. You need to mount it on a wall. And the problem with that is that then the, the way the signal radiates out isn't optimal. It sends a lot of signal up to, this, up to the ceiling and into the floor. If you're in a multi-story building, you're causing interference with people on those floors. So a solution that we have for that, whoops, I guess I didn't have an extra slide there that I thought I had. Um, our solution to that is some of our access points offer what's called uh, dual optimized antennas. So we've got two sets of antennas built into our access point and you can choose to use either a ceiling antenna pattern or a wall mount antenna pattern um, on a per AP basis. And you can control that either with a physical switch or through the GUI or through Nebula, you can change those settings. So you're using the right antenna pattern for where you've got the device mounted. Um, ceiling, or excuse me, smart antenna also does something similar. It just does it dynamically in real time. As we talked about, it goes through hundreds of antenna patterns. So if you're not mounting them on the ceiling, think about smart antenna, think about um, dual optimized antennas, paying a little extra to get that to help solve those issues. So now some general best practices. Um, again, most APs are designed to be mounted on the ceiling. So if you can, mount them on the ceiling. Most of these will have a general circular coverage pattern. So they're, you know, projecting the signal out equal distance in every direction from the AP. Um, so you'll want to try to mount them more centrally in the room or the area that needs to be covered. And within reason, 
mount the access point as high up as possible. The reason for that is you don't want the signal to have to penetrate people, walls, cubicles, things like that. So by mounting it higher, you generally have a much more direct route from the client device to the access point with a lot less obstruction that'll degrade the signal. So drop ceilings in general have very little attenuation. I know a lot of people, you know, we, we sell mounting clips so you can mount the APs onto the T-bar that holds the drop ceiling up. Um, you can absolutely do that, but for whatever reason, some places don't like that. They don't want you poking a hole in the drop ceiling to connect an ethernet cable. Um, maybe they're worried about fire codes and having something hanging from there. So one of the easy ways to solve that is to simply lay the AP on top of the drop ceiling. The APs aren't heavy, so they're not gonna cause the drop ceiling to fall through. The drop ceiling isn't gonna degrade the signal much. Um, and you don't have to worry about, you know, hard wiring into any place. It's, it's gonna stay in place. So that, that's another way of doing it. So you get good coverage. Just set it on top of the drop ceiling. Um, obviously pointed the right way. My, my graphic there has the, the access point pointed the wrong way. Um, but, you know, mounted the same way you would. Um, also, you know, you can always mount them directly to the real ceiling above the drop ceiling. But in general, my experience has been above the drop ceiling are all sorts of nasty things for Wi-Fi. There's, you know, big metal ductwork, there's conduit, there's water pipes, there's all sorts of things which will degrade or mess with the signal. So in general, um, my personal preference is if you can't mount it on the drop ceiling, you know, just lay it on top of the drop ceiling. It solves a lot of issues there for you. It makes things really easy. Um, hotels. Traditionally, the way of doing it was umbrella coverage. You'd stick an access point, you know, in the hallway. And depending on the room materials and things like that, you would cover anywhere from four to 16 rooms per access point, which was great. It worked really good in the early days of Wi-Fi, right? You can minimize the number of APs you need. You can minimize the number of drops you have to run. The challenge is, is the way people use Wi-Fi has changed so much from those early days. You know, it's no longer one lone guy with his laptop checking emails or maybe browsing the web a little bit and reading some stories on, you know, wallstreetjournal.com or whatever. Now, everybody's got multiple devices. A lot of those devices are very low powered because they're, you know, cheap Android tablets, they're little, you know, inexpensive phones. Even expensive phones don't have a lot of output power because you're trying to maximize battery life. And people are wanting to stream music, stream video, so just the usage has gotten so much higher um, that it, this umbrella coverage doesn't really work. So what we're seeing is most of your mid-tier hotels and higher are going to a, a pattern here where we're putting one AP per room or one AP per every other room. Um, so just about everybody now, including us, has these little wall mount APs, the lower power, um, designed specifically to handle that. So you put one per room is what they're designed towards. Um, so that's the new trend as far as hotels go, as far as the covering rooms go. Um, some other things to talk about here is look for, you know, flexibility in mounting. Um, you know, are you going to be mounting it directly to a wall outlet? Are you going to be hiding it underneath a desk or behind a cabinet or something? Because people will steal anything that's not locked down. So you might want to look, you know, make sure that the, the bracket locks pretty good. It's not obvious how to unlock the bracket that you've got them attached to. Also a good idea to have the ability to turn off the LEDs so you don't have a bunch of flashing lights um, scaring somebody. For public areas, basically you wanna be, you tend to be looking more not so much as to the uh, physical size of the space, but how many users are gonna be using. What's the density of users? The more users you expect to have in the area, the more access points you're going to need. In general, you should have dedicated access points for different areas, you know, don't try to use a, uh, a lobby AP to also cover the conference center or the snack bar or the bar, or whatever it happens to be, you know, provide them with their own dedicated coverage in each area. Um, smart antenna is a huge benefit um, in hotels, uh, both just because of the density of access points, but also the density of users, particularly in conference rooms and meeting rooms and things like that. Um, schools, schools are interesting because there's still a pretty good mix out there of what type of room. So, you know, some schools, every room is a smart room. Some schools, only some rooms are smart rooms. You know, some schools and some classes, maybe the, the, the devices only need network access, you know, a few days a week during study periods where other classrooms, 
Um, the teacher is mirroring her screen to every student's device and streaming video to every student's device simultaneously. So you, you want to find out a little bit more about what's going on in these classrooms. How many students are there? Is this a school where there's 20 kids per room or is this a school where there's 45 kids per room type of thing? And, and then plan from there, you know, are they using school issued Chromebooks? How much time are they spending online? Is there screen sharing, et cetera? In general, teacher and students should be on different networks, right? So they should each have their own VLAN that they're using. Um, for class sizes up to about um, more than 20 students, you would want to use two APs per room. One, I think I phrased that wrong, but if there's more than 20 students in the room, you probably need two APs in each room. Um, our access points have a mode in there specifically designed to handle smart classrooms and the weird behavior of, you know, 40 students coming in and connecting simultaneously to the network all at once. Um, and if you have more than 30 students, you absolutely need to be using something that's got smart antennas on it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Wi-Fi 6. Now, I've got another webinar coming up, I think, next week, um, where we go over all of our Wi-Fi 6 models, and we'll talk a little bit more about Zycel's offerings. This is more of a general thing here. Um, so 802.11ax, also known as Wi-Fi 6, also was marketed for a while as high-efficiency wireless. Um, so it's got some interesting things here. First off, it's designed to work on all frequencies. 802.11ac only worked on 5 gigahertz. So the 2.4 gigahertz radio that's in your 11ac device is still using 11n technology on the 2.4 radio. So Wi-Fi 6 improves both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz and has been designed so that in theory, Wi-Fi 6 can easily be ported to any other frequency that happens to come along down the pike. It's specifically designed to solve a lot of the things we talked about today that are causing problems with Wi-Fi. So it's designed with a number of different technologies to make it easier to have more devices on one access point, more access points in the same area, and to reduce a lot of problems here. It's increased the QAM, it's offered OFDMA. So now the, um, the access point can tell devices when it's their turn to transmit. So you've got central coordinator going on there. You can now do Moo MIMO from the client device up to the access point instead of only from the access point to the client. A um, bunch of other technologies in there that would solve a lot of issues that have been plaguing Wi-Fi for a long time. So it's a huge upgrade. Um, so Wi-Fi Alliance certification began end of last year. Um, the actual IEEE spec still is not fully approved, and it's still not um, expected to be approved until the end of this year officially, although there's no major changes expected to it. Um, so as I mentioned here, the first generations of silicon that came out there don't support a lot of the features, some of the main key features here. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, basically, in the rush to market stuff as Wi-Fi 6, a lot of products came out using first-gen hardware. This first-gen hardware does not support a lot of the key features of Wi-Fi 6, which make Wi-Fi 6 such a major upgrade over the previous versions of Wi-Fi. And you will not see anybody advertising it as pre-Wi-Fi 6 or anything like that. You, you have to be careful. Um, so I've got Qualcomm's comparison up here. Broadcom is very similar to this. Um, basically, the first few generations of chips are missing upstream OFDMA, upstream MIMO, um, TWT, BSS color coding, a bunch of other stuff there. So Gen 2 does. So generally, and again, it's, this is basically the same between Qualcomm and Broadcom. Um, so basically anything that probably launched before say um, August of last year is probably using a Gen 1 chip and isn't fully upgradable to Wi-Fi 6. So Everything we at Zycel have put out um, on the business side of things is using the Gen 2 chipsets and does support all of these features or will with a firmware upgrade. The Gen 1 stuff cannot be upgraded to add these features. So it's something to keep an eye on when you're shopping out there. Um, the other thing to look at here is a certain other competitor whose name starts with a U. Um, they're getting ready to roll out their Wi-Fi 6 solution. They've only added Wi-Fi 6 to the 5 gigahertz radios. They are continuing to use 11N technology on the 2.4 radios. So that's something else to keep an eye on. Look at the, the data rates on the, both radios to make sure you're getting Wi-Fi 6 on both of your radios. 
Because again, there's a number of new features here which solve a lot of the pain points of previous versions of Wi-Fi. It would really be, you know, why are you upgrading to Wi-Fi 6 if you're still keeping your 2.4 users on 11N technology, which is ancient at this point. And then also I threw in a new slide here for, whoops, typo, um, but for Wi-Fi 6E. So what is Wi-Fi 6E? So the FCC back in April has uh, voted to open up a new chunk of spectrum um, in the six gigahertz space for unlicensed use. So Wi-Fi 6E, the E stands for extension, is allowing you to now use the six gigahertz frequencies to provide Wi-Fi services. So it's a huge, huge chunk of space. It is adding seven new 160 megahertz channels that you can use. So remember we were talking about with five gigahertz, there are only two non-overlapping, non-interfering channels that can be used. So now you get an additional seven, so now you've got nine. And suddenly 160 megahertz channels start looking pretty good from a business standpoint, because now you can get nine access points using 160 megahertz channels before you have any co-channel interference issues. So it's a big boon there for people. Now there's a little catch here. Um, one of those catches is this spectrum is already being used by people, people with licenses to use this spectrum and they will continue to use this spectrum. So similar to how we have DFS on five gigahertz, there will be a technology called AFC, automated frequency control, um, to try to make sure that Wi-Fi devices and other unlicensed devices are not using frequencies that are currently being used by licensed users in this space. So that may, depending on where you are, may reduce the number of channels that are available for you. Uh, another interesting thing here is a number of mobile operators are planning to use the same frequency to roll out unlicensed 5G. So to supplement their normal licensed 5G, they are looking to have 5G using these things. So again, depending on where you are, you may end up in a situation where you're having to battle Verizon um, for access or for chunks of that uh, six gigahertz spectrum that's going to be opened up here. Um, so short version of this, there will be stuff out there um, probably this fall on the consumer side of things, right? Because consumer always gets everything first because they don't need some advanced features. They don't need some of the reliability. They're, they're more willing to be guinea pigs for, you know, firmware and stuff like that. So you will see some um, six gigahertz Wi-Fi 6E stuff coming out um, by Christmas time probably. Um, a number of chipset vendors such as Intel aren't even going to release their chips though until next year. And the Wi-Fi Alliance isn't going to be certifying anything in the uh, Wi-Fi 6E space until early next year. Also, right now, six gigahertz is a US only thing. So some companies that are more international and less focused on US business, they may hold off on rolling this out. Um, Europe has been looking at it. Um, as I understand it, first the European Union has to approve it and then individual countries will have to approve which, which sections of six gigahertz. Um, right now, as I understand it, the US is getting a much larger chunk of spectrum than anywhere else is expected to eventually get. Um, so it, it's really a technology that's aimed at the U.S. market at this point. And that, guys, concludes our presentation. Sorry for the interruption. I'm glad uh, Zoom allowed me to resume it since I was no internet connection at all there for a good minute. Um, but any questions, send them in with Q&A, and I will try to answer them. Um, while I'm waiting for you to type in your questions, you know, there's some contact info there on the screen. So my email's there. Feel free to reach me offline, seanr at zysel.com. Um, and then also, if you weren't aware, we do have user forums, or what we call user forums. So someplace you can you know, post questions, have conversations, ask for help. Um, and unlike some of the other user forums that are out there, our R&D team and our product managers at our HQ, they do check that form and they do respond to people. So um, you, know, you can write something out there and have a pretty good chance that somebody in HQ is gonna see it. Um, and if it's a question or a problem you're having, there's a good chance you're gonna get a response. So if you don't need to talk to someone right away, that's another means of getting help both from your other users and from Zycel team support. And I am not seeing any questions, which is really weird for this presentation. There's generally a lot of them. Um, thank you guys. Um, let's see here. Thursday, I've got a presentation. We're going over all the new features in Nebula. So for those of you that don't know, the last week of June, we rolled out a bunch of new features in Nebula. 
Um, so I'll be going through some of those new features and explaining what they are, where they are in the GUI, basics of setting them up. You know, probably one of the coolest features we've got there is we've added in, um, oh, what are we calling it now? DPPSK. Basically, instead of using 802.1x, which everyone hates, to do business class Wi-Fi, you can now just use pre-shared keys. You give each of your employee their own pre-shared key. And when they log in, they all use the same SSID. Um, based on which pre-shared key they use to authenticate, um, it will then assign the VLAN to them that you've defined for that particular PSK. So it makes it a lot easier to deal with, you know, employee turnover and things like that. Um, it's shocking how many businesses I go into and everybody is using the exact same pre-shared key, which of course means if you get rid of an employee, they can park out in the parking lot and get on the corporate network if they need to. Um, so that's one of the cool features. There's a number of other new cool features. So I'll talk about those features um, on Thursday. And like I said, next week I've got, I think it's next week, I've got a presentation where we talk about all five new uh, Wi-Fi 6 APs. The last presentation, I just dealt with three. Um, the other two will be here soon. So I will be talking about those as well. So feel free to join that. I'm sure Try and Marcus both have a number of presentations going on. Um, I'm not getting any questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and end today's webinar. Um, but again, my email's on there. Feel free to reach out to me offline with any comments, questions, concerns, suggestions for topics you'd like to see us cover, whatever it happens to be. Okay, thanks guys. Thanks for joining us.